Welcome to my first Reformed Encouragement Dialogue, aka Fred Talk. I was not sure how to approach this at first. However, I was given pretty open-ended instructions. So I said to myself, Randy, you advise and tutor science students as part of your job description. Why not tutor the listeners in just one of multiple applications of Romans 1 verse 20? Romans 1 verse 20 For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. As a person who tutors and studies biology, chemistry, physics, and math, I love the idea that laws of physics, which do not change over time or location, were created and set in motion by an immutable God. Genesis 1 and John 1 verses 1 through 5 tell us that all things were created by God and through the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. This includes the laws of physics. John 1 verses 1 through 5 In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. But why is it important that laws of physics do not change? It has to do with the scientific method. The scientific method. At the core of science lies a problem-solving approach called the scientific method. The scientific method has five basic steps plus one feedback step. Step one, we make an observation. Step two, we ask a question. Step three, we form our hypothesis or a testable explanation. Step four, we make a prediction based on the hypothesis. Step five, we test the prediction. Then step six, we iterate. We use the results to make new hypotheses or predictions. If experiments cannot be reproduced, or if laws of physics changed, life would be chaotic. We could not do science, and all fields related to science would be pointless. Is it not even more comforting to know that our God the Father and Savior Jesus Christ do not change? Psalm 55, verse 19. God, who is enthroned from of old, who does not change, he will hear them and humble them, because they have no fear of God. Malachi 3, verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. James 1, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. To me, it is a natural extension that God would make his creation filled with unchanging laws of physics. I want to spend the next half hour on giving a concrete example of what I mean about an unchanging law of physics and how it helps me to see God's handiwork. So now I will put on my tutoring role and discuss the scientific topic for the day, forces. Hopefully, you will also see God's handiwork in the small aspect of his creation. So when I say the word force, What's the first thing that comes to your mind? If you're a Star Wars fan like Pastor Mark and myself, you may be tempted to think of the following. Use the Force, Luke. Of course, that's not exactly what we mean when we say force in the, when we talk about physics. In physics, force is defined as... The definition of force. In science, force is a push or a pull on an object with mass that causes it to change velocity, in other words, to accelerate. Force represents as a vector, which means it has both magnitude and direction. So now, let's think about physics and forces. The best way to think about physics or doing any time I tutor is pictures. You almost have to have a practical example, and pictures are a great way to learn physics. Here, we have Tilly and Billy moving a grandfather clock across the floor. Another great tutoring technique I like to use is try to cross-discipline things, pull things in together across many fields. In this case, I'm going to try to draw an overall picture before we actually talk about forces, just to show you the idea of 
integrating biology, chemistry, physics, and math. So to move this ground of the clock, most likely they're using their muscles. Well, let's look at the biology of the muscle. So let's look at the bicep. The bicep would make sense because they're pushing and pulling on this ground for the clock. If we took the cross-section muscle of the bicep and looked at it, this of course is called skeletal muscle. Well, skeletal muscle is basically a collection of muscle fascicles. In other words, we pull out one of these and expand it, it'll look very similar, just smaller in scale. And like I said, this is called the muscle fascicle. Well, what's a muscle fascicle? Well, that is a collection of more things. <laughs> if we expand on that, we now have something called the muscle fiber. Huh, we can go further. The muscle fiber is a collection of what we call myofibrils. So in other words, several myofibrils are clumped together to form a muscle fiber. Several muscle fibers are clumped together to form a muscle fascicle. Several muscle fascicles are clumped together to form the skeletal muscle. That is what provides the bulk of the bicep, or any skeletal muscle for that matter. But what are myofibrils consisted of? Well, we can go further yet. Let's zoom in even more. These are called sarcomeres. Well, sarcomeres consist of proteins that look like this, and they're called either thin or thick filaments. So they're just proteins, thin and thick proteins, and that's what gives, that's actually what will lengthen or contract to cause motion of your muscles. It's really quite fascinating when you think about it. At the microscopic level, which we won't get into exactly, but it just makes you want to recite the verse. Psalm 139, verses 12 through 14. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I'll never forget learning about all this physiology muscles and Dr. Nordewehr's physiology and Prof's zoology. It's just, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Of course, in tutoring session, we have textbooks. And I would be referring them back to a picture like this. As you can see, this picture is much better than my crude drawing on the board. But when you're doing a tutoring session, you just need them to get the basic ideas, and they can always go back to their textbook. And this is what they would actually see. And this is what I think is just fascinating. But that's biology. But now let's flip to the other side of chemistry. We can go zoom in further, of course. Because thin and thick filaments have to be made of something. Well, we know that the fundamental element building blocks of all things are atoms. Since we're talking organic compound here, living organisms, we know there has to be carbon. That's the definition of organic chemistry and organic compounds. So there has to be a carbon atom. Well, carbon atom, carbon-12, we'll say, consists of, if you remember from your basic chemistry, consists of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The nucleus contains the protons, and since it's carbon, it'll have six protons. It also consists of six neutrons. We'll put them in green. We'll color code it. It's ironic that I'm colorblind using color coding, but you find out students love color coding too. It's a great way to remember things. But because it's neutrally charged, for each proton, there has to be one electron. So it has to be six electrons. 
the electrons will occupy what we call electron clouds or space around the nucleus. Now what's fascinating, we can get into a little bit more math here, maybe a little overwhelming, but just to give you an idea, the atomic radius, in other words, the center of the nucleus to the outside edge of an electron, atomic radius is typically 1.0 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. That's really small. But to give you an idea of how compact all this really is, but or more fascinating to me is how compact the nucleus is compared to the cell, or oh, sorry, the atom. The nucleus volume, in other words, looking at his volume compared to the atom's volume, this is 10,000 times smaller. In other words, it would take 10,000 nucleus to fill up one atom. There's a lot of space between, you know, when we draw this, we never draw this as scale. And now you know why, because it takes 10,000 of these to fill in that area. Fascinating when you think about it. But technically, are we done? Are neutrons and protons the smallest we can get? Well, now I flip back to physics. Physics has found out that protons and neutrons are called hadrons. And hadrons, in this case, we'll take the example, let's take a proton. We can zoom that out even more. And they're made up of three quarks and three gluons. Gluons are what gives you the force that holds together the quarks, which make the protons and neutrons. So as you can see, we have now gone from macroscopic to the muscle, all the way down to the atomic, down to the subatomic particles of quarks. All this is going to make sense pretty soon, because you may be asking, what's the point of all this? Well, forces. All these have to do with forces, as we'll get to pretty soon. But now, we zoomed in. What happens if we zoom out? Well, we can also zoom out, obviously. Muscles are part of the human body. We are on the Earth. The Earth, since I gave you the radius of an atom, which is 1 times 10 to the 10 meters, the radius of the Earth is 6.4 times 10 to the 6th meter. And now when you look up, do you not sometimes think of verse... Isaiah 40, verse 26. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. This earth, obviously, we then have the sun. Again, not drawn to scale. Why is it not drawn to scale, Randy? Well, if the earth has a radius of that, the sun's radius is 7 times 10 to the 8th meters. That's otherwise saying 432,000 miles. Just like it took 10,000 nucleus to fill that, given this, how many Earths does it take to fill our sun? I'll give you a hint. It's a lot more than 10,000. It takes 1.3 million Earths to fit into one of our sun. That is just, the magnitude just blows your mind. God's handiwork is just fascinating. Now, our sun is relatively small compared to other suns out there. One of the largest ones is called UI Scuddy. I cannot draw this to scale. I do have a graphic I can show you. There you see it. The radius of U Scuddy, instead of saying in meters, what they say is they will put it in solar radius. In other words, the diameter of our sun, 
how many it goes in there. Well, the radius of Usat Sede is 1,700 solar radii. In other words, it takes 1,700 of our suns just to make the radius of U, UI Scuddy. Okay, if it takes 1.3 million Earths to fill up the sun, how many of our suns does it take up to fill U Scuddy? Well, it takes 5 billion with a B. So 5 billion of our suns fits into U Scuddy. Yes, truly, our God is a very creative God. Psalm 19, 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Now that we have the picture drawn and complete, we can now discuss the forces involved. There are two generally types of forces. Notice Billy and Tilly are touching the ground of the clock in order to apply their force. Skeletal muscles, which are consisted of muscle fascicles, which are consisted of muscle fibers, which are consisted of myofibrils, which are consisted of sarcomeres, which are your thin and thick filaments, they are all in contact. So we have contact forces. What type of contact forces are there? We know that if, if they want to push it this way, they have to apply a force. So applied force is one of them. Push, pull, or think of a thrust of a rocket. So this one will be our force of applied. We'll put AP for applied. She's pulling, he's pushing. So there's, since there's carpet here, we know that it's hard to push things across carpet, but it's easier to push across linoleum. Why is that? That's due to friction. Friction, obviously, is another contact force. He's going this way. So we'll call that F, lowercase f. F is for friction. There's another one called the floor is pushing up on the ground for the clock. That's called the normal force. Well, actually, they just say F N for normal. That is a contact force. Another one. Let's look at the pendulum of the grandfather clock. The bob and the rod, this rod has a tension in it. So we can have a tension force. That's a contact force. The bob is pulling tension on the rod, and the rod is providing tension on the bob. One that we don't have pictured here is what happens when a parachute falls through the air. It falls slower than a bowling ball, right? Because that's due to what we call drag. Let's we'll just say D for drag. That's otherwise known as air resistance. That force is also a contact force. The last one, which is not on here, but you can actually think of it microscopically, is called spring, which is spring force. Think of a spring, it has force, and that's, of course, another contact force. Okay, if we have contact forces, do we have such thing called a non-contact force? In other words, is there something called action at a distance force that you can think of? Actually, there's three of them. You're very familiar with one of them. If I take my pen and let it go, it falls. 
That is due to what? That's due to gravity, right? So that is your weight force. But gravitational is also what keeps the planets in their orbit. So you have gravitation, They're, again, forces are keeping them into their orbits, which are technically oval, not orbit, um, circular. Another action at a distance force goes back to this area of our picture. Positives and negative, protons remember positive, electrons are negative charge. What do we call that? That would be electrical. You are very familiar with electrical fields during cold, dry weather. Static electricity builds up, you shock yourself, you comb your hair and it stands on end. All that is electrical, which is at a distance forces. And the third action at a distance force, which I know you're very familiar with as well, is, and if we go like this way, we, it's hard to push them together, right? That is your example of magnetic. And now we can finally tie it all together. You can see the formulas for calculating these different types of forces. I will not bore you more than you already are by explaining these equations. Suffice it to say that these equations have withstood the test of time. Also note the many different constants within these equations. The universal gravity constant G, the electrical constant K, the permittivity constant epsilon naught, permeability constant mu naught, etc. Those constants also withstood the test of time across history and will work over time and location. Based on these equations, many other physics applications are able to be done and many other equations are able to be derived. We can narrow our focus even more and find three fundamental laws on which all these equations are based. They're called Newton's laws of motion. These three universal constant laws are fundamental to science and I would dare say fundamental to creation. As a side note, and for a later discussion, God is not limited by his own creation and can work outside of the laws of physics. Therefore, I wholeheartedly accept miracles as true events. I will end my Fred talk with a short, fun activity where you can see a direct application of forces, experimentation, and the constancy of equations. Here we have a simple little pendulum experiment. A pendulum works by having a what we call a bob on the end of a rope or string, or it can be a hard rod or whatever. In this case, it's a string. A period is the amount of time it takes to do a complete swing. So if we start here, swings and back, that's called one period. The length of the rod, or in this case string, is 25 centimeters, approximately. That means that we should have a period of one second. It should take about one second to go from here to there. So I'm going to time five periods to see if we get five seconds. Go. One, two, three, four, five. And according to my timer, it took five seconds. So that's about right. Now, the question is, if we double the mass on the end, what will happen to the period? Now, I doubled the end of the weight on the end. There's now four masses as opposed to just two as we did previously. The length is still 25 centimeters. The question is, will the period, the time it takes to do one complete swing, be less than or greater than when we had half the amount of time? So I'll reset my timer to zero and we'll count five periods. Go. One, two, three, four, five. And according to timer, it also took five seconds. So no matter what the mass is on the end, if your length is constant, the period is the same. And now for our last crude little experiment, you'll notice that I shortened the length of our pendulum. We were at 25 centimeters. Now we're at 6.25 roughly, which is roughly one fourth the length. So if we went down one fourth the length, what do you think is going to happen to the pendulum's period? How much time will it take to go one period? Remember when it was at 25 centimeters, it took one second. 
So now we took one fourth of the distance. So let's see what happens. We'll count five periods again. One, two, three, four, five. It took two and a half seconds to do five. So therefore one period is half as long. It's 0.5 seconds as opposed to one second. The experiment I did at home, anyone should be able to do. We've done them in the labs as kids. We'll do them throughout history and they'll always work because of the laws. All right. The first time I did this, remember, my length was 25 centimeters and one period was one second. Then I lengthened to 6.25 centimeters and now it fell to 0.5 seconds. Anyone familiar with the grandfather clocks? Well, remember grandfather clock, one period is said to be two seconds. It goes, it takes two seconds to do one period in a, grandfather, in a typical grandfather clock. Well, what's the length of grandfather clock? Notice, if we doubled the time, we quadrupled the distance. So if we want to double the time, would it make sense to go to 100 centimeters? Technically, this is about 24.9, this is 99, it's not exactly, but it's close enough. Well, how do we, I did not pick these numbers by random, these lengths. I happen to know that a period is 2 pi. Mm, pi. Times the square root of L over G. As length increases, period increases. If we were on the moon, we'd have to use the gravity of the moon. Here on Earth, we, we're 9.8 meters per second squared. Another constant, which I'm very glad does not change. So hopefully now you can appreciate another reason why the constancy of the laws of physics is a good thing made by an immutable God. Revelation 4, verse 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being.